Is there is there anybody here for the first time? I, I, I couldn't see. Can you raise your hand real quick if you're here for the first time? I, I Awesome. I, I can't. There you go. I see some people over there. Some people. Oh, so glad you're here. Um, this is what we do. You know, we've had some time where we're worshiping God and singing songs to him. Now we're going to study the word of God. And as we study the word of God, I pray that you'll get this word. Um, really, I would even say take notes. Because I really believe that this word is going to help you overcome and help others overcome and help you to know Jesus a little better today. Um, right now, our Pomona campus, is they're doing a dry run right now. So let's say hi to Pomona campus. It's not their grand opening. They're just doing a dry run right now. So we're glad that they're tuning in. Today, what I want to, we've been doing a series on the attributes of an overcomer. And, and there's, there's scriptures, that, that scripture says that we're more than overcomer through Christ. And, and the first lesson that we did on this teaching was you'll never be an overcomer unless you believe that God wants you to overcome and that you are an overcomer. It was a mindset. Before it becomes a reality, you have to have faith in God, that God wants you to overcome whatever you're facing. What does he want us to overcome? If there's an addiction that you're facing, and you're saying, I, I've been fighting against it, I don't think I could overcome. Jesus, the word of God says, who the son sets free is free indeed. You can experience freedom. If you're in this room and you have a broken heart, and you say, man, I, I'm really super depressed, don't give up. Definitely don't commit suicide. This is a time for you to just stop and realize that God can get you through this, and God heals the brokenhearted. You could get healing in this room today. What does God want you to overcome? He even wants you to overcome the power of sin in your life. What that means is sin had the power to separate you from God. But Jesus' death, suffering, death, and resurrection has the power to reconcile a relationship with him. You feel far away from God. God is saying, this moment, today could be your day to be forgiven of your sins and truly have a brand new start in life and reconcile your relationship with God and then reconcile your relationship with others. Because I really believe if we reconcile with God, then it makes, it room, it makes room for us to reconcile with others as well. But today what I want to talk to you, I'm not going to talk to you about, about just faith and overcoming. I want to talk to you today about your identity as a believer. And I really believe this, that you'll never overcome if you don't have the right identity. Right now we're living in a society that is pegging us with all kinds of names. But this is the idea is that most people don't know who they are. And because they don't know who they are, they're easily manipulated by statements that people say over you, and you start repeating negative statements that is said over you. I know that right now you might be depressed, but I want you to get this. You don't have to name that over yourself over and over, I'm depressed. How about I'm an overcomer? And, and, and you could say I'm depressed, but you could also say I am an overcomer. You could say I'm sick, but you could also say I am healed. You could say I've been, you know, I, I've sinned, but you could also say I've been forgiven. And, and so God wants us to have the right identity over ourselves. And we need to start saying not what the world has said, not what you said over yourself. You need to start saying what God has said over you. Someone say identity. So we're in the book of James, and we're still in James chapter 1, verse 1. And we see James, the author of the book. We find out that James um, was Jesus' half-brother. That means he grew up in the house, same house as Jesus. We also see that James... Um, he ended up being the pastor of the Jerusalem church. So he was a big shot back in those days, and he was a pastor of a very prominent church. But James, after he looks at all of his titles, and I don't know what he did for a living, because a lot of these guys actually had a trade. And in Jesus' household, there were carpenters. And they might have been great carpenters. And he might have said, I'm a carpenter. Or he could have said, I'm the pastor of the Jerusalem church. Or he could have said, check this out, I'm Jesus' half-brother. But when James introduces himself, we've seen this last week, he goes through all the titles that he could have claimed over himself, and he chooses a title 
that best represents his relationship with God. He chooses the title that best represents his relationship with God. He was saying all the other titles are going to fade away. But my devotion and my relationship to God, that will last forever. So he identifies himself. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tri Jewish tri believers, tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. So James describes himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm going to make this very simple. This is what he was saying. He was saying literally this. I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And, and you'll never be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ until you make a decision and declare it over yourself. I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Are there any devoted followers of Jesus Christ? And that's all he was saying. I'm devoted to him. He was also saying it's God's will over my will. You know, um, I did some studies on a satanic church. And there's actually people that are Satanists. That means they worship Satan. They have pentagrams. They, they tattoo them on themselves. They'll do sacrifices, uh, blood sacrifices. They're actually Satan worshipers. And they have, believe it or not, um, they have a Bible. Anton LaVey built a Bible for the Satanists. They study their satanic Bible. And the satanic Bible has commands just like uh, our Bible does. And their Bible, their number, one Bi their number one scripture that they base their whole belief on is this. Do what thou wilt. Or do what you want. Now what James was saying was this. I've been doing what I want my whole life. But there was a day that I devoted myself to follow Jesus. And I'm done doing what I want. I am now defining my life from here on out. It's not my will. It's what he wants. When I did it the way I did it, it led to depression. It led to it led to problems, it led to fear, it led to doubt, it led to prison, it led to destroyed relationships. I am tired of doing it my way. Is there anyone here that you're, you, you are tired or you're tired of doing it your way and you want to start getting different results? Well, James got to that point and he was converted. But once he was converted, he was clear. From here on out, it's not my will. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, I live, for, I live to do the will of God in my life. I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It's important to have the right identity. Because if you don't have the right identity, you will not live it out. Your identity and how you see yourself is going to determine your decisions, it's going to determine your emotions, and it's going to determine how you react under pressure. Devotion. The word devotion just means this profound dedication to a person, purpose, or assignment. To be passionate. It means to be a worshiper, to love. You'll never be, you'll never overcome in any area that you're not devoted to. I've heard a lot of people say, I've tried church. I've tried the God thing. And they use it as an excuse of why they're no longer serving God or going to church or reading the word. They try to see, you don't try God and get the results. You become devoted to God and then you get the results because every single person that starts living for God, I want you to get this, there will be resistance. There is an enemy. There'll be doubt that comes your way. There'll be trials and tribulations. Everyone will be tested. And only the devoted followers of Jesus Christ continue to follow him when it gets difficult. 
How many are devoted here in this house? Devoted, let's talk about devotion. So James would say this, I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It was a declaration. It was his identity. Devoted followers of Jesus Christ allow Jesus to live in them and through them. Devoted followers of Jesus Christ allow Jesus to live in them and what? Do, do you believe there's a difference of accepting Jesus into your life and allowing him to live through you? But devoted followers of Jesus Christ aren't just okay having Jesus in their lives. They want to see Jesus manifested in their thinking, in their actions, in their love, in their forgiveness. They want people to see Jesus in them and through them. If your family is going to get saved, if we're going to reach a city like Pomona, if we're going to reach a, a city like TJ, if we're going to reach the impoverished, uh, impoverished place like Kenya and reach them with the love of Jesus Christ, they're not just going to listen to our words. They're going to listen, they're going to listen and focus on our actions. Can they see Jesus if we never said a word? Would they see Jesus living through us? If anyone's going to see Jesus, they're going to see it in us. Look at the scripture in Galatians 2.20. says this. My old self has been crucified with Christ. That, what this is saying is, how many know Jesus was crucified? What this is saying, when we become believers, there's an exchange. I give up my old life for a new life. And if I don't give up my old life, I don't get the new life. How many want to get the new life? With this, it happens. We got to be willing to crucify the old life. See, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live. No, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is James actually saying? James is saying, look, I've lived my life the way I lived it. I'm no longer that person. That person that used to be a cheat, that used to be an adulterer, that used to be a liar, that used to be a hustler, that used to be a conniver, that used to be a pervert, that guy's done. And now I'm living, come on, Christ is living in me and he's living through me. We need to stop. And declare that over yourself. Say it with me. I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. As you declare that over yourself and that becomes your identity, this is what it's going to do. It's going to empower you to live that out. Some of our victories come only when we, be, when we get in agreement with the word of God. If James was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ... This is what God is calling us to be. Devoted followers of Jesus Christ and devoted followers of Jesus Christ get different results to those that are not totally devoted. Now, James was also saying when he was a slave, this was the second thing he was saying. The first thing he says, I am devoted. I'm a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The second thing James was saying is this. I am no longer a slave to sin. See, we will never truly be set free from the power of sin until we know we can be set free from its dominance. We can be set free from its dominance. Now, James could not be a slave to sin and be a slave to God. What that meant was he couldn't obey both voices. How many know that every one of us have two voices? It's a voice of right. And it's the voice of wrong. And how do you know which voice or which God you serve? The one you go with, the one you obey is the one you serve. So James was saying, I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm a slave of God, but I'm no longer a slave to sin. I stop here and I just want to just let this settle for a second. Because could it be that you're not overcoming that temptation because you didn't know you could overcome it? 
Maybe you're still identifying yourself as of a slave, as a slave of sin when God came to set you free from sin. Now, when I say that, there's some uneasiness in the church. And the reason there's some uneasiness, because we so identify ourselves with our weaknesses and our failures. And what we do, we use as a reference point our experience instead of using a reference point, the word. But if we go back to the word and we take on the identity of Christ and what God said that we could live, this is what's going to happen. You'll be able to overcome your anger. You'll be able to overcome the lust. You'll be able to overcome the pornography. You'll be able to overcome the lying. You'll be able to overcome the fears. You'll be able to overcome the abuse that you went through. You'll be able to, be able to overcome the past because Jesus has come to set you free from sin's dominance. Let's look at this scripture. In Romans 6.6, 6, someone in this room you're struggling. And you've gone to a therapist. You've tried everything. You know, I was listening to Mike Tyson the other day. And Mike Tyson is now, now like really promoting marijuana. And he's promoting it because he makes a lot of money. He has a ranch. I think it's Temecula. And it's a, like a marijuana ranch. Where you could, it's like, it's, he's trying to create a marijuana Disneyland, Mike Tyson. But the other day I heard an interview with him, and he's gone past marijuana. As now he's into psychedelic drugs. And I found out that la last week, California began to legalize psychedelic drugs, marijuana and psychedelic drugs. So we're talking about mushrooms. Stuff like that. And then he started saying, he said this. He goes, he goes, I love psychedelic drugs. And the guy goes, why? Because it makes you a god, is what he said. He goes, psychedelic drugs set me free from drugs. So if you want to get set free from drugs, take psychedelic drugs because they'll set you free from drugs. It's like, like saying, I used to be a murderer, but what set me free from murdering is I just killed two people. But the crazy thing is people are believing it People are saying, oh, that's what I need to get set free from the sin that's entangled me. That's what I need to get set free from the torment that doesn't let me sleep at night. This is what, needs to, what I need to do to get set free from the anger I'm um, hurting people that I don't want to hurt. This is what I need to get set free. This is what I need to get set free from the deep depression that's in me that makes me want to commit suicide. What I need is some psychedelic drugs. And the reason Mike Tyson is going, he said, Pastor Mike Tyson is going to be listening to me. I know. This is the truth. He could be listening, and I'm going to give him the answer. Mikey. First of all, I ain't scared of you. Because I'm not fighting with my fists. I'm fighting with my spirit. And I say, Mikey, I got something to tell you. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. You don't need weed. You don't need psychedelic drugs. You don't need mushrooms. You can be set free from the power of sin because Jesus came to set you free from the dominance and the cycle of destruction that you've been in, Mikey. Maybe people are scared to tell them the truth. What he said in this interview kind of was interesting because he's trying a new thing and he's trying the poison on a toad. And he's smoking the poison on the toad. He says, when you smoke the poison, I'm not selling drugs, I'm just telling you. 
I said, wow, let me try that right there. <laughs> Maybe that's what I need right there, the poison on the toe. He said this is what happened to him. His soul separated from his body. He goes, I experienced death. And then I heard, after I experienced death, I began to hear a guide speak to me. And then he says, I wasn't sure if it was good or it was demons. But that experience changed my life. And I would say, Mikey, it was demons. And these demons, I want you to get this, have control over you right now. You're under their authority. And right now you are proclaiming and spreading a message of witchcraft, of addiction, of pain. And you're leading a whole generation into the same pit of hell that you're in that you can't get yourself out of. And you're giving them false hope. So, Pastor, why are you talking about this? Because there has to be a difference between believers and non-believers. We got to stop acting like we're, come on, we're still sinners. We're still stuck. We're still bound. That's not true. According to Scripture, you can be set free from your past and live a new life by the power of God's Spirit. Can I hear an amen in the house? Let's read Romans 6, 8. I got to set this up because I'm coming against a mindset that's destroying churches. Christians are walking, I tell you, weak because they have a false identity. You associate yourself more with your past than with your new experience with God. You know your past better than you know your new life. I'll always be abused. No, you don't have to always be abused. You can rebuke that spirit of abuse. Say, you're no longer going to abuse me. You know, you're a sinner. No, I'm not. I used to be a sinner. But I'm a sinner that's been saved. I'm now a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I live for God alone. Someone's going to get set free by just this little piece right here. Romans 6, 6. We know, look at this, that our own sinful selves were crucified with Christ. Let's ask this question. Was there a day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you never broke up with your sin? Because if that happened, there's a problem. You're not saved. Because for you to live a new life, there has to be a death of an old life. You can't say, I want to come back, I want to come to Jesus, and you're presently in an adulterous affair, and you like being here because you like my preaching. I like the way Pastor Marco tells it the way it is. But you're not making any adjustments. You're not breaking up with your sin. And just because you're in this house doesn't mean you're saved. Right? Doesn't mean you're born again. Doesn't mean that you have a relationship with God. You know about God, but the devil knows about God too. He probably knows more about God than you do. So, Pastor, why are you talking like that? Because I love you. And I want you free. And I want you to experience what living for God is really like so you can start sharing your testimony. This is my before. This is my after. They don't look nothing alike. And I love who I become now in Christ. But it happened the day I broke up with my sin. You know what's crazy? There's people that will come here and they left their old church and they're trying to hide out here. You left your wife at the old church, and you're coming with your girlfriend to this church. We don't need members that bad. I'm going to send you right back to your old pastor if I find out. He's right here. He's trying to hide right here. We caught him. You, 
And maybe God brought you here today to give you a reality check because somehow, some way, you got some false doctrine in your mind to make you think that you're saved and you're practicing sin. Do not be deceived. Those who practice these things, sexual immorality, adultery, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm not saying it's not available for you, but there has to be a breaking up, a death to the sin so you can live a new life. If anybody leaves right now, you know why. I have to go to the bathroom though, right now, man. It's not going to look good. Just stay right there. Stay right there. It's, it's, that's the guy. That's the guy right there. <laughs> so, okay, look at this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. You mean I don't have to do what my sin tells me to do? No. That's why Jesus was crucified. And that's why when Jesus was crucified and you gave your life to Jesus, you picked up your cross and you died to your old life. I want different results. See, there's no resurrection until the, the, there's a death. See, before we can celebrate your new life, we have to go ahead and bury your old life. And that comes with a decision. I am done living the way I'm living. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the hurt. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of what's doing my family. I'm tired of my mind being going all over the place. I'm tired of the torment. I'm, I am tired of living that way. Is there anybody tired? Don't justify your sin life one more day. Let's go ahead and have a funeral and resurrection today. Now, it's okay to identify your addiction but it's not okay to identify your addiction and claim it over you for the rest of your life. Okay, I was a slave to sin, but I found out I could be free. You could say I was a, I was a prostitute. I was, I did have a, 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 I was a sex addict. I was a pervert. Praise the Lord. I had deep anger issues. I was a career adulterer. I'd go in cycles of adultery. Three months off, four months on. Wax on, wax off. I was known as a liar and a cheat. You couldn't trust me with nothing. My mom couldn't trust me with nothing. But I'm no longer, I'm no longer a liar. I'm no longer a cheat. I'm no longer an adulterer. I'm no longer, come on, I'm no longer a backslider. I'm no longer a drug addict. I've been set free because Jesus said that I am no longer a slave to sin. And this is good news for somebody who wants to be free. Because if you want to be free, how are you going to do it? Are you going to do it God's way or Mike Tyson's way? Hey, pastor, you know, I just, I just want to let you know, I just stopped smoking weed. Oh, awesome. And what I did was I used cocaine. And I like cocaine better now. <laughs> there we go. Mike Tyson's way. Drop one sin and pick up another one. But you're still addicted to sin. Let's keep on reading this. For when, when, for when we died, someone say, who died? I thought Christ died. No, when he died, we died to our old sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. We're set free from the what? 
Someone's going to just get delivered today because of this. Your identity is going to be freedom instead of slavery. You mean I could overcome? Look at this. this. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Today's the day. I see it happen all the time. You know, when I looked at, when I looked at this video up here, and I saw one of the men that was getting a haircut, and we've been working on him for 17 years since we started the church. And he was a drunk on the streets, a drug addict on the streets. That was his life. And when I see him up there with a smile and free, I go, he used to be that. He's been set free from the power of sin. That man is now in our men's home. He's living a new life. He is smiling. He's working in the church. He is serving God. His life is no longer the same. He's originally committed for six months. He goes, nah, I'm committed for a whole year. I want to make sure I complete a process. That was something he would have never said. He would have never found himself in a home. But there was a day that he crucified his old life and he said, I'm living a new life and I need to live this new life, not only for me, but for my family. This is a new legacy. I used to be that. I'm no longer that. See, anybody that's in Christ is a new creation. And, you know, this is what I do know. There's a lot of people that are, have talked themselves into being an atheist. To talk yourself into being an atheist, yeah, because no one is born an atheist. Every little child, I, I get, I, this, is, this is scientific proof. Go to any country. You could go to Mexico, you could go to Africa, you could here in America. And you talk to little boys and little girls, and they believe in God. So why would someone talk themselves out of God? Because they don't want to let go of their sin. The reason people get mad when you mention God, because you're encroaching on their lifestyle. So if I could get rid of God, I could get rid of the guilt, I could get rid of the shame, and I could get rid of the judgment. But you could erase God in your mind, erase God in your language, but there's one day you're going to stand before the creator of the universe and you're going to find out all the erasing didn't erase them. We're in a cancel culture and we're canceling everything almost as good. But it's not, it's not off God's books. Praise the Lord. I'll read verse 14. Romans 6, 14. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So what gets you, what sets you free? It's God's forgiveness and grace. It's not your ability to live free. It's God's ability to set you free. And it's not that you fix yourself is that we acknowledge, hey, God, I need freedom. He goes, I can help you. God, I can't overcome this on my own. I've tried to quit millions of times. Hey, guys, I totally understand. That's where my grace comes in, my merited favor and my merited power. I'm going to give you power to live a new life. I'm going to give you new desires and a new ability to live a new life. And today that could start. I want to end it with just one last statement. James saying he was a slave was just saying this. I am devoted, I'm a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The second thing he was saying, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And the third thing he was saying, I am holy. Say it with me. I am holy. Holy, holy moly. What? Holy, what does that mean? In 1 Peter 1, 14, it says this. You must live as God's obedient children. How should we live? We shouldn't live as God's disobedient children, but as God's obedient children. Look at it says, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Because this is how you're supposed to live. You're supposed to live as God's obedient children. And he says this, don't slip back into your old life. Because the reason you came to Christ, because that old life wasn't paying off. 
don't forget how miserable you were when you originally came. Don't forget that day. You know why? Because when you start living for God, things get better. And when things get better, you forgot the pain you came from. But he said, don't go back. This is it. You didn't know any better then. Like when you came, you didn't know better. You didn't, you didn't know that there was an option. But now you know better. So why would you go back to that relationship that you were asking God to deliver you from? You forgot the abuse. You forgot the loneliness. You forgot the depth of the pain and darkness you were experiencing in your soul. He says, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And this word holy means, first of all, it means a life that belongs to God alone. Someone say, I belong to God alone. It means a life that is sacred, physically pure, morally blameless. A life dedicated or devoted to the service of God and the church. One who lives a godly and pure life. A person who lives an exceptionally holy life. Again, it be belonging to God alone and separated for his use alone. Say, when I got married to my wife, you know what we call it? Holy matrimony. You know what holy means? Belonging to. My relationship with my wife is separated from every other relationship on earth. My wife, check this out, belongs to me. And I belong to her. And that's it. I don't share my wife. So, Pastor, why are you talking about sharing wives? People are sharing wives up in here. She don't share me. Now, I'm not talking about, I, I can't involve a ministry. You know what I'm talking about. We don't have no orgies. Let's break it down. We don't try to do fantasy island in our bedroom. What's your fantasy? My fantasy is, stop it. So, Pastor, that's dirty. No, I'm talking about sin is dirty. And just like I wouldn't, I want you to get this. Just like I'm not going to share my wife in any, with anybody, she's not going to share me with anybody. God doesn't want to share you with anybody. So being holy is just saying this. I belong to God and God alone. I'm not up for rent on weekends. Oh, my Lord. We got, we got to be careful. We got Christian prostitution happening. I said, Pastor, what does that mean? If someone offers you enough, you go to the other side. Oh, Lord. But when you finally say, and when you finally say this, you're going to start living the life that you were meant to live. The power, the authority, the provision, the expansion, the growth. You're going to start seeing growth, growth of joy, growth of peace, growth, come on, growth of ministry, growth of your family, growth of your marriage. You're going to start seeing growth when you're devoted. That means you're planted. So that's all James is saying. I'm a slave of God. I am totally devoted to God. James was just saying when he was a slave of God, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And what he was saying next, I am holy. I belong to God. My eyes belong to God. My ears belong to God. My body belongs to God. My decisions belong to God. So just so you know, I'm all in. And when you have that kind of identity, 
You're going to start walking in a power that you've never imagined you could walk in. The Bible says this, when you submit to God completely and you resist the devil, he's going to flee. But people that aren't submitted to God completely don't have any power over the devil. It's only devoted, complete followers of Jesus Christ that power over demons. The reason we don't see more Christians casting out demons because we don't have enough devoted, submitted, committed Christians that are following Jesus that are saying, I'm under your authority so I can start walking in your authority. Okay. We'll end it with this. We're done. You know, this week was so interesting that we had teams hidden. We had teams hidden in San Bernardino. We, had, we were cleaning up streets. We had teams this week in going to Pomona witnessing and sharing their faith. We had a team in TJ this weekend doing Adopt-A-Block in TJ. And this is what happened. There was a, they, they went on this apartment complex. This is the first time Adopt-A-Block has ever hit TJ. A matter of fact, it's a stigma not to go knock on doors in TJ, especially in certain neighborhoods. But our team doesn't know any better so they just go knock on doors. And we've been trained that we're devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And we've been trained even to another level. We're willing to die for this if we could reach one. I was crucified a long time ago. How are you going to re-crucify me? I've been dead. Because for me to live, it's going to be Christ. And for me to die is gain. I don't care what you do for me. You kill me, I go to heaven. You know, you start walking like that in the streets, they'll be like, oh my, he crazy. And we came upon an apartment complex, and this lady's running out. And one of our ministers or, or members of our church caught her as she's running out. He says, honey, how you doing? And she began to just share what's going on. And, this lady's been beat, um, been abused and beaten, and she's scared. She's thinking that she's going to die pretty soon because her abuser is picking up momentum. But she has no way out. So we told her, there is a way out, honey. If you just call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved today. And we could break this cycle of abuse that you've been under since you've been a little girl. You know you've been abused since she goes, I've been abused one relationship after another. You can be free, honey. So at that moment, we began to pray for her on the streets. And she starts screaming at the top of her lungs. The people that came on Adopt the Block from Tijuana never seen a demon cast out. And they said, what's going on? I go, she has a demon, and we're going to cast it out of her. They said, what was the demon? It was a spirit of abuse on her. He says, there's a demon of abuse? Yes. When you have a spirit of abuse on you, this is what it does. It causes you to be abused no matter what relationship you're in. And unless you get set free from that demon, the abuse will continue. So they were there on the streets. And they cast this demon out of this lady. And after they set her free, she was saved and free. She, we went back to her apartment. They moved her right out of that apartment. And now she's a member of the TJ church already. And she's ready to serve. But that's what happens when you send devoted followers of Jesus Christ in dark areas where there's bondage and there's addiction and there's torment, a believer comes in and says, I don't care what darkness is here, there's something in me that's greater than the darkness that's here. And this is what we do. We shine our light. How many know God is good? And you know what's so good about this? This is for everybody. Let's all stand up. Someone say, this is for everybody. Don't get jealous if another believer is doing good. It's for you too. You can have peace. You can have joy. You can be forgiven. You can be set free. 
and it can happen today. Are you ready to be like James? Because I'm ready to become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I've been so devoted to so many things that have been so destructive, but I'm done being devoted to a self-destructive lifestyle. I'm done. And the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Be careful that your identity is not your sin. Because if your identity is your sin, you're going to be stuck in that identity. Whatever your identity is, why don't you exchange that old identity for a new identity? Stop justifying a painful lifestyle that's hurting you, hurting your family, hurting your own dignity. Say, I'm done. I want change. Well, James came to that conclusion himself. Even though he was a brother of Jesus Christ, he wasn't a believer until Jesus Christ died and resurrected from the dead. And, God, and Jesus had a private meeting with him. And he became a believer after Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. One encounter with the resurrected Savior saved him and brought him from one category of being a non-believer or unbeliever to a sold-out, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Now, you cannot convince me that Jesus doesn't exist or he's not all powerful. It's too late for that. I've had an experience with the resurrected Savior Jesus Christ. And you can have that too today. It is real. You'll see it in your life if you're willing to open up your mind and say, I want a new start. I want a new beginning. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I'm not here offering you religion. Don't hide behind a religion because nowhere in the Bible does it say if you join a certain religion, you'll go to heaven. How you receive eternal life is first acknowledging, man, I'm a sinner. And I've been a slave to sin. I've been doing it my way. And I'm tired. And I got good news for you. Jesus is not here to judge you from the past you've come from or the things that you've done or doing. He's here to let you know you can have a new leader in your life that would lead you to peace, lead you to joy, give you eternal life, and forgive you of every single thing that you've ever done. Jesus loves you. God loves you. And he wants you to have this full life. And you can have it. You're one choice away. There's only two options. Receive, believe, or re just doubt and reject. But one day you'll stand before God because every one of us will. We'll pass on. We'll die. We'll, it's over. And after you die, the Bible says, you stand before your creator. And what are you going to say? I never heard it. You can say, no, you did hear it. You heard it. I loved you so much I brought you in that room so you could have a new life. There's people that have let you down, and I understand that, and caused you pain, walked out on you. But God will never do that to you. He loves you, and he loves you more than anybody's ever loved you. Why don't you open up your heart today and say, Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Forgive me. Make me whole. I receive the gift of eternal life. I want to become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And there are others in this room that you're in church, and you've been in church a long time. But this is what God's saying to you. It's time to sell out 100% and become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. 100% surrender to God. So you could have started experiencing the power you're meant to have in your life. The peace you're meant to have in your life. The joy you're meant to have in your life. And purpose. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. These, just these 30 seconds are going to determine what's going to happen. James came to a place where he goes, yes, I believe, I receive. And it changed his destiny, it changed his life, changed his purpose. Just saying yes. If you're in this room and say, Pastor, I don't know if I were to die right now, I'd go to heaven. But I want to be saved. Or I think I might go to heaven. And I say, why? He say, why well, go to church? Nowhere in the Bible says if you go to church, you go to heaven. Well, I, 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 I did some, I did a communion. 
Don't worry about it if you do communion, you're saved, or any type of religious practice. Or my family's a Christian, does that count? Well, it's great that they're Christians, but no one's going to get into heaven by association. You're going to have to make a decision yourself. He's knocking on your heart's door and saying, will you allow me to forgive you and cleanse you and give you eternal life? And only saying yes to that request of God entering and Jesus coming into your heart, are you going to be saved? And you're done. You're saying, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I need, man, man, I just lost my devotion to God. I want to recommit my life to the Lord today. Let it be today. That's your day. Recommit your life. Or I'm not saved, but I want to give my life to Jesus and become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of eternal life. When I count to three, if you're in one of those groups, I'm not sure right with God, but I want to get right with God today. Or I'm a believer, but I need to recommit. I've lost my devotion. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hands all over this building. This is a moment of truth. As you say yes, your life's going to change immediately. One. When I say three, raise your hands. Two. Three. Raise your hands all over this building. Say, Pastor, that's me. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Come on, anybody else? God's spoken to you. I see those hands. God's spoken to you. Tonight, today's your day. God spoke to you. I see those hands. I want you to be a, do me a big favor. Every one of you that raised their hands. I want you to do me a big favor. Will you give me the honor and privilege to pray with you? I want you to leave your seat and come up here real quick. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray together. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming up. If you raise your hand, come on up. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there? I'll go up there with you. There's somebody right next to you might need to come up here. This is their day. They just need someone to support them. It's time to get your devotion back. Time to get your fire back. I'm proud of every one of you here. What's your name? It's your day. There's a page turning. And you've been hoping, man, when is this page going to turn? And God says, today's your day. You got to receive this by faith. You're going to be able to live this life. And there's been a call on your life since you've been a little boy. And you've been aware, like, there's something different with me. And God's going to fulfill that. But he needed this moment today, Israel, that you would surrender everything. And I'm, God's going to give you the power to surrender everything. It starts right now. Ready? Come on. Come on, Israel. Let's do it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we're speaking freedom. Let's do it. Let's be, let's be free. You know, serving God ain't no joke. Anybody can live for the devil and live for the world. But it, it's serving God, it takes a real man to serve God. Real woman to serve God. This is the first step. Proud of you guys. Aren't you done tired being a slave of sin? It's going to destroy your life. It's destroying your life. It's going to continue destroying your life. I'm done. And what you're doing is taking a step today. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life. Forgive me. Set me free. Make me new. And from this day forward, I'm going to become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ with the power of God helping me. Come on, let's get devoted. Come on, let's get devoted. Let's get devoted for God. You've been devoted to sin. Look at the destruction it's brought. Proud of you. Proud of you. What's your name? Tony. Glad to, I'm glad you're here, Tony. It takes a real man to do this. God's going to help you, though. He's proud of you that you took this thing. I'll take, I'll help you. We're going to get through this. Come on, let's give a hand for Tony today. Church. This stuff is real. The power of God is here. People are being touched by the presence of God right now. God is setting them free right now. It's happening. Let's pray together.
Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I admit I've done it my way for far too long. I need you to save me, Jesus. Set me free from the power of sin and the devil. And fill me now with your Holy Spirit, with your power. Make me holy. Make me free. Give me a new heart to live for you for the rest of my life. Today, I accept you. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will follow you with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with my body, with everything I have. I'm born again. I have eternal life. I'm saved. From this day forward, I confess I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. If you came up here, I'm, we're going to pray with you. Don't leave until we pray with you. We want to get some information, help you on your next step. Baptism is your next step. It's a sign of your old life being buried and living a new life. Also, Wednesday night, Gavin Tate's going to be here. Revival Wednesday night. You do not want to miss it. Next Sunday, we have one of the top evangelists in the whole country, in the whole world, coming here. T Teo Hayashi, he's going to be here. He has, he's a Brazilian pastor. He's going to be here. It's going to be awesome. The 13th, uh, 9 and 11 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. Sign your teens up for the conference, youth conference, this weekend. Uh, it's actually the 11th. God bless you. Remember, this is God's for you. No one can come against you. Any prayer? Please come on up. We'd love to pray with you. I want to make sure we got enough help up here. We need some more help up here. We need some more leaders up here.